Welcome to Theory of Pets. I'm a passionate pet owner with a drive to help others like me uncover the truth about the pet industry and what goes on behind the scenes. When it comes to dog training, there are so many different methods out there. It's hard to choose the one that is going to be best for you and your dog. Sometimes it becomes a trial and error uh, effort where you, you know, try to find things that work and sort of piece different types of training together. Today I had the pleasure of speaking with Tom Shelby. Tom is a dog trainer and now a writer. Uh, he recently released his book, Dog Training Diaries, Proven Expert Tips and Tricks to Live in Harmony with Your Dog. And that's really how he works with canines. He tries to um, foster that harmony between the dog handler and the dog. Um, he has trotted dogs in front of Westminster Dog Show judges. He has a lot of experience training working with search and rescue dogs. Uh, Tom has kind of been there, done that, seen it all. So uh, I was really excited to talk to him today. He calls himself a uh, quote unquote depends dog trainer. And I really related to that type of training. He says, you know, training depends on the dog, the situation, the environment, all kinds of different variables. So it's not this like one size fits all type of training. It's more of an overall approach to, you know, like I said, fostering that harmony with the dog and the trainer and, um, you know, seeing what's going on in different instances. Every dog's different. Every situation is different. So um, he refers to himself as a depends trainer. And I really liked that. Uh, his approach is generally to take what the delinquent dog gives him and turn it into a transformative moment. No strong arm tactics, no yelling, nothing like that. Uh, he really focuses on socialization being the key uh, to a well-behaved dog and today I really wanted to focus on some tricks for leash training because I get questions all the time from pet owners who are either uh, trying to train either a puppy that they just got or an adult dog that they adopted that's not leash trained. I get tons of questions about the right uh, training equipment to have when you're training a dog, uh, questions about you know what to do if your dog pulls on a leash, leash aggression, all of these things. So uh, I talked to Tom about all of this stuff and um, you know he started off by just explaining a little bit about his method of training and how you know socialization is really key and then gives us some great tips and tricks on leash training as well as some of his own firsthand experiences so um, I was really thrilled to speak with him I think you guys are going to really enjoy this interview. Tom thank you so much again for being on the show today uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and your dog training style. I, I literally, Samantha, had 800 plus appointments a year trained dogs when I lived in New York, about half for behavior problems. So I came to somebody's door with an aggressive dog thousands of times. The owner, in the great majority of cases, was holding the dog back on a leash while the dog was pulling very hard and acting very aggressive, wanted to eat my kneecap. And what were 95% of the owners doing? They were literally petting the dog soothingly, saying, it's okay. If you had a four-year-old child who was frightened of the ghost on Halloween, you could say to that child, it's okay, it's a little boy under a sheet. But your response to a dog as the behavior is happening is what trains a dog. They live in the moment. So when the dog is being aggressive at the door and you're petting the dog trying to soothe it, what you are inadvertently doing is rewarding the behavior that's taking place. Okay. And what is the what is the voice intonation saying? It's okay. It's not okay. So thousands of times I I witnessed this, and I, you know I wanted to say, is this the behavior you want? And needless to say, the owner would say no. And I wanted to say, then why are you rewarding the dog? But I didn't say it because they weren't cognizant of it. They didn't realize training a dog is letting the dog know you like the behavior or you don't as 
the behavior is happening. It's timing, Samantha. Timing is critical with a dog, absolutely critical. And when I say there's no domestic animal that knows body language of a human better than a dog, I'm really not embellishing. They also read your face. I've been married now over, I don't know, 95 years. And <laughs> Well, give or take. <laughs> and if I say something that my wife is not thrilled with, you know, I can take uh, one look at her face and I know she's not happy. So does your dog. Dogs read our faces just as well as our significant others. So that concept of rewarding unwanted behavior inadvertently is critical for people to understand and the, the value of timing. So, okay, you know, another example which I see countless times is the dog that jumps on people. And it's, it can be a friendly jump, you know, how, hello, my name's Bowser, give me a pet, and the dog jumps. So the word I use for jumping is off, not down. Down is a very important command for a dog to lay down. So I may, and again, you know, when people say to me, what's your methodology? My answer has always been, it really depends. I don't know. My methodology for a 140 pound dog that bit several people is going to be different from my methodology for Cavalier King Charles Spaniel that's 10 weeks old. It really depends and it depends on what I read in the dog. So let us assume the dog jumps and I just with a frown on my face may shrug the dog off and say off and a split second later the dog has four feet on the floor. What I've witnessed so many people doing at that point start chastising the dog for having jumped several seconds ago. But actually, the dog is now with four feet on the floor and the unwanted behavior has stopped. And in all my lessons, I tell people, when you, let's say, shrug the dog off, as you say the word off, and a split second later, four feet of the dog are on the floor, you need to immediately sp smile. You can say, thank you, or good, good boy, whatever it is. You don't have to drop to your knees and make love to the dog. But trust me when I, believe me when I tell you, hundreds of times I've looked like a lunatic and off, thank you, off, thank you, <laughs> off, thank you. If the timing is right, Samantha, the dog very quickly will learn when those front feet come off the floor, I'm not terribly happy. But or I, when the four feet are back on the floor, I am happy. And if the timing is done well, I literally can stop a dog from jumping in seconds because they get it if the timing is well. So this concept of the inadvertent rewarding of unwanted behavior, I go through quite a few examples of that with, with clients so that they understand when the unwanted behavior happens, frown, whatever the correction is, and I don't use the word no, uh, by the time I get there, half the dogs think her name is No Bad Dog. <laughs> um, I, I, I have seen a beautiful t-shirt where I live with a picture of one dog meeting another saying, Hi, my name's No Bad Dog, what's yours? And I loved it because uh, I remember a client who named their dog Noah, and I suggested, well... You know, if you ever use the word no negatively, no is not a real great name. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, so, so this inadvertent rewarding of uh, unwanted behavior predicated on body language and voice intonation, this is what dogs read. So if the dog's jumped and now you give it a, you know, a three minute soliloquy why it was wrong, the dog's sitting there and being chastised when the dog is really being cooperative. So very, very important concept. And we'll, we'll get to the leashes. Now the other concept, I live on the island of Martha's Vineyard and one of the first things, and I have a column here, um, 
it's called Ask the Dog Charm, where people send in their questions and I write the answers. So people have started calling me. I came here to, to basically retire, but um, as Mark said, Mark Twain said, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. So, That's right. Um, and you're probably in a very similar position, Samantha, and I commend you for that. Um, so uh, people started calling me, and I got an apprentice because I'm not looking to do eight to 900 appointments a year, so I do far fewer. But one of the very first things I tell the people on this island is, and I say it facetiously, um, the first thing I want you to do is rent an apartment in Boston just for a few months and I want you to walk the dog five times a day and the concept again are the nine words been there done that seen that no big deal the dog who has seen it all is a friend is afraid of nothing is the stable dog so you know I remember working uh, walking a German Shepherd I was boarding and training when I lived in New York and I lived across the street from the state park and we went up there and there was a tree stump um, that had been partially burned and between the scent and I don't know if you know, I also use, use dogs, two dogs that I trained over a, a, a more than 20 year period to find missing people. So oh, wow. I'm extremely cognizant of a dog scenting ability. As a matter of fact, Samantha, as you're sitting or standing as I'm speaking, you're dropping 40,000 dead skin cells a minute, which creates in search and rescue what we call a scent pool. Uh, but anyhow, so I'm on, I'm with this German Shepherd, which takes note of this burned tree stump, and he never smelled anything like this or saw anything like it, and was extremely afraid of it and uh, on alert. If I had laughed and, just, and said it's just a tree, tree stump, stupid, and walked away, I would have left that dog with something to be frightened of. If I had just made love to him, it's okay, don't worry, I am actually rewarding the fear response, and this is a very fine line to, to walk. Not rewarding a fear response, yet supporting the dog when it's afraid of something. Um, and I, I'm thinking of another example. Um, have you seen in the great state of Maine, they had a couple of years ago, lots of these large plastic statues of cows about. Yes. Um, yeah, so um, I have a French poodle now I adopted five years ago, a standard poodle who was afraid of everything when I adopted her. She's not anymore, but I was in New Jersey visiting one of my kids and the dog saw one of these cow statues, which are life-sized, and just freaked out. It took me about 20 minutes till I had this dog sniffing the cow and realizing no big deal. And again, you know, when the dog really showed fear, my response was, oh, that's an interesting looking statue, isn't it? And I kind of conjure, I was happy. I wasn't saying, oh, it's okay, it's okay, because she was fearful. And I don't want her fearful and tell her that's okay. I want to support her and say, wow, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? And I kind of caught the dog was looking at me. And very slowly, we kept approaching. And when she took a forward step, I, I'm never without treats on me. And the treats I administer are uh, are the size of crumbs. It's not the size, it's the association. And every forward motion, she got a treat and some encouragement. And it literally took me 20 minutes till she was sniffing it and realizing no big deal. And that's the concept. Been there, done that, seen that, no big deal. So when uh, I remember several years ago, a couple moved from rural Alabama to midtown Manhattan, and the dog was, you know, totally freaked out by sirens of ambulances, throngs of people, etc. And, you know, this dog didn't, wouldn't even, didn't want to go out to urinate or defecate. It was a very, very frightened dog. So these are, 
I, I, as I said, it's a very fine line between supporting the dog without rewarding the fear response. So I get animated and happy and make slow progress forward. Um, I remember in Manhattan, um, just as we were passing a truck, it backfired. The dog jumped about six feet up in the air and then didn't want to pass the truck. And that took me also a while to get the dog to pass the truck. And, and then I went back and forth. So, so the dog's attitude is no big deal. I've experienced this and I survived unhurt and it just worked out fine. So these are two concepts. When I say socialize a dog, expose it to everything you can think of um, with, with a positive attitude. Um, is a very, very important concept. Then you have a much more stable dog. Let's talk about leash training. Uh, that's what I wanted to focus on today. Uh, how do daily walks benefit dogs and dog owners? Of course, they're getting their exercise, uh, but there are some other really great benefits as well. Well, it certainly is, is very, very important, and that's part of the bonding. I mean, the more walks you take, the more socialized the dog gets as long as you're, you know, you're doing that with cognizance of the dog's response to everything. Um, and it does help with the bonding and, and uh, you know, there's another expression in my business, which is a tired dog is a well-behaved dog. <laughs> and Absolutely. Boy, is, is that valid? Uh, and yesterday I took about a two and a half, three hour hike and, uh, you know, that makes all the difference in the world. Um, so I, I think there's great benefit to taking walks with a dog in terms of socialization, in terms of exercise, in terms of bonding. It's very meaningful. You know, if a dog's life is the backyard and, you know, in the house, it's an unsocialized dog and it's more likely to be afraid. And one of the six to eight types of aggression is fear aggression. It's probably the most common type of aggression I've run into with dogs that were fearful and the attitude becomes the best defense is a good offense. So what next question for pet owners that have adopted a puppy and would like to work on leash training, what are your tips? Um, you know, one of the keys uh, is, is pulling. Um, you don't want to want to pull, and what is often suggested in um, many of the books, and I just make mention of that in my book, Dog Training Diaries, um, when the dog pulls, you just stop. And the moment the dog stops pulling, you continue walking, and when the dog pulls again, you stop. And it, it comes to understand that we will continue making forward progress and have the fun of learning about the environment um, through the dog's nose. Um, it, but the reality is most people don't do that because it could take you 45 minutes to go, you know, 100 yards. Um, because a dog, especially if you have a very enthusiastic uh, young dog, be it a 10-week-old dog or a 7-month-old uh, dog, and I, I facetiously say all the time, dogs go from puppy to junior high school punk, which, depending on breed and other circumstances, can be anywhere from 6, 7 months to, uh, to a year or a year plus. Um, to you know, from so from puppy to punk to young adult, so you have the very enthusiastic uh, seven month old whatever type of dog. It's pulling like crazy. So how does one stop the pulling? One can stop every time the dog pulls, and I, I have yet to meet people who can really deal with that successfully because you just make so little progress. Um, a, until the dog puts it together and it can take a long time for the dog to put it together so the walks won't get you very far. So what is the leash attached to makes a big, big deal. Um, I, I normally suggest um, that with most dogs, they use what's called an easy walk harness. You're probably familiar with it. It attaches at the, the leash attaches at the chest. And that 
basically will eliminate 50, 60, 70 percent of the pulling with most dogs and make things a lot easier. I also am now experiencing this a great deal. I am telling people who are a bit older, don't get a big dog because I just dealt with a lady who had a shattered elbow when her big labradoodle and she was she was an older lady retired when the dog pulled her down um, and she just had the leash to a flat collar which which never stops a dog from pulling they just choke themselves and pull so the easy walk harness where the leash attaches at the chest is the easiest way to mitigate lots and lots of the pulling the the method to eliminate 90 percent of the pulling are gentle leaders are you familiar with a gentle leader yes that's a fantastic training tool Yes, it's an excellent training tool, but I have also found, I have told all of my clients, buy the general leader. I told them what size to uh, buy, and don't put it on the dog till I get there, because um, I, you want to acclimate the dog to it on a very positive basis. Um, I would also, before I put the gentle leader in most cases, have taught the dog uh, a leave it command. And leave it is a very, very important command, especially if you did search and rescue. Um, I, you know, I've been on a search where a deer crashed through the woods right in front of us, and I just had to look at my dog and say, leave it, get back to work. Right? All I had to do was say, leave it. Wow. So I, I teach dogs to leave it every single class and I work with, the dog needs to be taught leave it. And I do, I start all training, almost all training in the confines of the house where you have the fewest distractions because a very important concept of dog training is to have success build on success. So um, if a dog is outside, well, let me put it to you this way, Samantha. When you come home, and you, am I correct in assuming you have a dog now? Yes, we have two dogs. Okay, so when you come home and your two dogs sniff the cuff of your pants, they know who you touched, what you ate, and what environment you were in. Again, it's why Mark Twain said if, dog, if, if dogs could talk, nobody would own them. Because um, they, they, have a, they have a history on you for the day. So the point I'm making is if you're trying to teach for, you know, initially a dog different things outdoors, the distraction level is much more intense than indoors because the, the dog is aware of the blade of grass that the squirrel urinated on two hours ago. <laughs> and if it's a, very, it's a very young dog, it's going to be distracted by the, the scent it finds on the wind. In search and rescue, you had tracking, which is um, a dog on a 40-foot leash attached to a harness, and if I have what's called a PLS, a place last seen, where somebody stopped to tie their shoe, they created the scent pool, as you and I are creating, as we're sitting wherever we are, all these dead skin, skin cells are falling, and they create a pool of scent. So if I have a PLS, a place last seen, I bring the dog there, on a harness and a 40-foot leash, point to that piece of ground, and say, track, and wherever that missing person walked, we would be able, the dog would be able to follow just following the footsteps as he's dropping the scent particles. Most of the searches I had been on did not have a PLS, a place where seen. So now you have no idea, even if you're in the area where the person is, the missing person is. Um, so in that case, we're working the wind cone. You find out where the wind is coming from. And I would tell, take the dog off leash, and that's called um, air scenting. And the dog works the wind cone. And that is where it's especially important, or even tracking. You know, if another dog is off leash while the dog is tracking, I have to tell my dog to leave it, even if the other dog wants to play and continue working. So I would 
go to your house and I would put uh, a hot dog in the middle of the living room floor on a plate and we'd walk by that hot dog and it would probably take me a minute or two teaching that dog ignore the hot dog and walk by and one of the critical parts of leash walking is what I call loose leash. There has to be no tension on the leash. When I walk to the post office from my home, they don't deliver mail where I live. I have to go to the post office box, which is very close. I swing a six foot leash around my shoulder and I don't touch it with my hands. And then I know I am not compromising by pulling it all. I say heel and the dog walks, whatever pace, whatever turn, I take without whatever it sees. If it sees another dog or a squirrel, I say leave it and the dog has to ignore it and not pull the leash off my shoulders. So the gentle leader really eliminates 90% of the pulling because it's the same concept, Samantha. If I pull you by your nose, what's following is your head followed by the body. The difficulty and the reason I don't tell my clients just put it on the dog and take a walk is when you put a pair of sunglasses on your face, you know why they're there. When you put something on a dog's face, all the dog understands is get this crap off my face. So I will show the dog the gentle leader and the moment it sniffs it, because to a dog it's through the nose, the moment the dog sniffs, that gentle leader, I give it a treat and it now has a positive association. And then I size, I size it properly. It needs to be rather tight, right behind the ears, not down where the collar is. And the mouthpiece, the, the, power, the part that goes around the snout has to be as loose as possible, but not so loose that the dog puts its nose down that it slips off its nose because if it's got something tight around its mouth, it's going to protest it even more. And then we immediately go out and take a walk, and every time the dog is not protesting it with its paw or trying to roll and, and rub it off its nose, every time it walks, I am praising and offering a little crumb-sized treat, and if it starts pawing at it, I will tell it, leave it, which it has been taught, and then we continue walking, and it often can take as much as 20 minutes, a half an hour, till the dog really starts walking with it. And then another important concept, and I've run into this, um, the wife uses the gentle leader, and the husband says, I don't want to use that. And I, I, you know, as best I can, I express the importance of consistency. The dog is going to make it much harder in the wife if the husband doesn't use it. We need to be consistent. And then the general leader starts to represent a, um, a positive thing, going out for a walk, exploring the world. So that general leader is very, very valuable. I show people, I tell people, you know, kiddingly, I have the strongest pinky in the area and I can literally hold the leash of a large dog with your pinky when you use a gentle leader. It turns the head, but the consistency and the, and the acclimating the dog to the gentle leader is really important because 95%, maybe 97% of the dogs will never um, just readily say no problem and accept it. I've run into several that have, and I, in my career, I can remember two dogs that never really accepted it, but then I really didn't know what happened in between lessons. Um, you know, consistency is really important. So one of the best things is a gentle leader which teaches the dog not to pull. Um, for the Braxis, the phallic dogs, the the pugs and the bulldogs that have the, uh, they don't have the elongated snout, they have the flat face. Those dogs, and interestingly, there's a very, one of the best known trainers in the country, his name's Brian Kilcommons, he's a good friend of mine. And I've seen him put a prong collar on, um, on a pug. And the reason is the pug 
immediately stops pulling because the last thing you want to put on a braxocephalic dog, the, the pushy, you know, flat-faced, flat-nosed dogs, is a regular collar because you really, they have breathing issues quite often. Um, I, if I remember correctly, Bill Weld, who was uh, the governor of Pennsylvania, um, and I worked with his dog, he had a couple of pugs and one passed away with breathing difficulties. You don't want to put a flat collar on a pug. You want to either put a harness on it, and he experimented with this, and it was quite effective. The dog felt the bite of the prong collar once and didn't pull anymore. And that, I, you know, I'm not sure I'm recommending that, but I've seen it work with this particular pug. If you get a junior high school age pug that's very enthusiastic and it pulls too hard on it, you may have a problem. And Brian is an excellent trainer who's very cognizant of this. And this works with this particular dog. So there is a possibility there. It's not one that I'm really recommending. I'm just sharing. I've seen that work. Uh, also on an American Bulldog, um, uh, and not, not an American, an English Bulldog, where they used that before I got there and said it stopped the pulling completely and this dog had no issues. So there is a feasibility with that. Um, so, and the, the harness that attaches at the middle of the back is is not something I suggest if you have a pulling dog. As I explain to people, um, I actually, as a gift, piloted a dog sled for 20 miles to your state, actually. Oh, wow. Uh, in Maine. Yes, and that was a terrific experience. But the analogy I make, Samantha, is if you want a dog to pull, I mean, picture the Iditarod, they're all pulling on a harness that's attached to mid back. So if you don't want a dog to pull, and so many people think they want to be humane to the dog, and they end up getting dragged all over the place, um, then use an easy walk harness uh, or acclimate the dog to a gentle leader. Um, that's what I suggest. And teaching a dog to heal, you know, that's another thing. I have explained how to do that, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll be happy to explain it, but I have found that I really needed to teach the dog and then affect what I, I refer to as the leash transfer so that my working with the dog walker helped or the dog client that would really help them with their timing um, and, and figuring out how to work the leash. So, to teach a dog to heal, dogs work professionally on the left side. So, uh, you would, and I have, uh, you know, just thinking of uh, a young lady who uh, had lost her sight in her left eye and I then reversed everything so she would have the peripheral vision and could see the dog, and I taught the dog to heal on the right side. But professionally, um, dogs work on the left side. And again, talking about body language, so one would use the word heal and always take the first step with the left foot. So the dog gets conditioned. When that left foot moves, you're, you, the dog, are moving. If you were to tell the dog to stay and step away, it would be incumbent upon you to step away with your right foot. Because if you step away with the left, the dog is getting the body language signal to start moving. So these things are, uh, are really important if you want to have a well-trained dog. So we start walking. I use at least, I, I use a six-foot leash. And the dog immediately forges ahead. I say nothing. What I do, Samantha, is I make a 180 degree turn and reverse my direction, and I am now walking in the opposite direction that the dog just took off, and the dog hits the leash, I say nothing, kind of hard, and I'm just walking in the other direction. If the dog starts to make a left turn, I make a sharp right turn, and when the dog hits the end of the leash, the dog says, well, we're going in that direction. If the dog starts cutting me off to the right, I make a left turn into his face. When done properly and timed properly, the dog's attitude quickly becomes, oh man, I gotta pay attention to this idiot. He's always going in the wrong direction, man. When I'm 
I'm not with him, I get caught at the end of the leash with an unpleasant um, jerking myself. And it, it literally takes me five minutes till the dog is now, there's only one way the dog can know which way you're going. And that is by staying next to you and looking to his right every once in a while to see where I'm going. If the dog walks very quickly, I walk at a crawl space. And interestingly, in Manhattan, the women, and it was primarily more so women than men, walk much faster than I do. And I got the impression they were almost trying to keep up with the dogs. And I would say if the dog is walking quickly, we need the dog to understand it has to walk at your pace. And if the dog is walking very slowly, I break into a trot. So the, word, the key word I use is opposite. So the dog realizes, oh man, I gotta pay attention to this person so I don't get caught at the end of the leash. And as I said, most people um, need a little help in getting this done expeditiously and effectively. And I've told most people, you know, and in my book, because it's part of basic training, I explain this and I write it in the book, but honestly, I find um, they could really use some help with this. Uh, the gentle leader will make things a heck of a lot easier. The prong collar, I really don't like to use. I do not uh, really like you know, teaching using the principle of pain. Um, but I am not a pure all reward trainer um, because I, I really have a lot of experience and you know, the analogy I make, uh, Samantha, when I get to, to a person's home and I see a seven-year-old child sitting on the dining room table eating mashed potatoes with his fingers, I know I'm going to have a tough time with the dog because I didn't parent the kid. Um, and you, you find, I have found very often when I've seen a child like that, the dog was completely wild and, and not uh, given direction. So... I, as I said, I am a dependent trainer, you know, I, and I am into all rewards training most of the time because you can get much more done with, you know, with um, smiles and treats than with negativity. But when I get to a five-year-old dog that was just adopted and has serious issues, sometimes these issues need to result in a consequence. And the consequence can be as light as when the dog jumps on you and you frown and stay off and they shrug the dog off. Um, the dogs are very sensitive. They don't want your negativity. They want the praise. So what I do really does depend on what I'm dealing with. Um, I, I was the go-to guy in Manhattan for a bunch of years for aggressive dogs. And the vets would say, I'm not telling you to euthanize this dog, call Shelby, he'll be honest with you. And uh, I will say honestly, I probably had two to four dogs a year where I had the awful um, job of telling people uh, this dog is seriously dangerous and my my breaking point was if a dog was, was, was good with a family and aggressive with everybody else and they wanted to live with that and were willing to live with those risks I would work with them and the dog and God bless um, you know this is a miracle land of litigation you need to keep the public safe but if the dog does not aggress at you um, and you want to keep the dog okay I will help you but when the dog was threatening the owners seriously threatening them I mean I, I remember a dog that every time they ate if they didn't toss pieces of food from the table to the dog the dogs bit them the dog bit them I mean oh wow and, and, I, and, you know listen I I, I I got a million stories um and this this was a seriously dangerous bite and most dogs have what's called bite restriction they give a warning bite um but when you have an unrestricted bite where the dog really bites down um that then we're talking about a dangerous dog as a matter of fact when i worked with the police in search and rescue one of the reasons when you teach a dog to um be a patrol dog 
uh, is you wear that sleeve, and you, you so when the dog bites the sleeve, it starts learning to unrestrict the bite, um, which many dogs have to be taught. And dogs learn bite restriction in the litter. When a puppy bites another puppy a little too hard, and that puppy runs away yelping, it learns to restrict its bite. When the puppy bites the mother's nose or breath too hard, the mother straightens them out. Um, I have found just from experience, single um, puppy litter uh, often was, uh, not often, but sometimes more often than with larger litters was lacking bite restriction um, because it just wasn't given enough instruction by the mother to restrict the bite. So uh, um, that's an important uh, concept when it comes to, um, I, you know, to dealing with an aggressive dog. Um, I, and I dealt with an awful lot of aggression. And there are, as I said, six to eight different types of aggression. Um, so you, you have fear aggression, you have dominant aggression, uh, you have resource guarding, um, you know, I ask everybody if you go near the food bowl when the dog is eating, does he freeze and stare at you or does he actually growl or does he go to bite you? The resource there is the food. Um, you may, you know, I ask everybody, so if you're eating baby back ribs and a rib slips off the table and falls on the floor, can you take it from the dog? Or is the dog's attitude, I'll die before I give you this? Um, and it can be very subtle. You can be sitting on the couch with your toy poodle and your grandchild starts approaching and the poodle starts growling. The resource in that case is grandma and the dog doesn't want to share the resource of grandma, doesn't want the attention taken away and given to the grandchild. So the resource can really vary. I need to observe and see where the dog is coming from. Um, so these are, you know, how are your two dogs, Samantha? Do, do you feed them right next to each other? We do feed them together, yes. We work with our dogs from puppies or um, we get a lot of dogs, most of our dogs come as rescues um, and we work on socialization and aggression issues immediately uh, when they come into our house, which is something that I always recommend to people is that, you know, you don't take the few days to let your dog settle in or anything like that. You need to start training immediately. Music to my ears, absolutely. Um, absolutely immediately. You know, I've heard people say you want to start training until those nine months old. You know, I just shake my head, boy, is that a mistake? Uh, you know, it's like telling the kid I'm not going to teach him manners until he's in high school. Uh, so, um, yes, all right, I'm glad to hear that I figured you would have pretty civil cooperative dogs um, they're both rescues uh, mixed breed they're both one's a lab we've had her since she was a puppy uh, one is a beagle mix she is a rescue and we actually we lost a boxer last year she was a rescue as well um, and our our boxer and our beagle were actually opposites our boxer was very timid um, she had come from an abusive home which made her fearful of everything and then our beagle was the opposite she is completely fearless and was very um, not aggressive, but she would definitely was the alpha dog when she came in and wanted to let everybody else know that this was, you know, her stuff, her food. Um, so we had to nip that in the bud with her. And then the boxer was the opposite where, you know, like you talked about, it was just, it took years, literally years to get her to a point where we could just walk down a city street without having any panic attacks. You know, you, use the words alpha dog and I can tell you if I remember correctly um, in a litter of puppies by um, I think it was nine or ten weeks the pecking order is, is established um, and it's important because then there's, um, there's cooperation and civility if you all you know cooperate with each other as opposed to fighting for as to who's the boss so that that is um, you know it's an important uh, it's an important concept, and resource guarding is is a big one. It can be uh, the toys, um, 
you know, that the dog plays with and doesn't want to share with another dog or a person. Um, and then you have um, what's called the pain aggression. You have the dog that would never dream of biting you, who gets hit by a car, gets a broken leg, and you pick it up to bring it to the vet, and you move that broken leg, which causes enough pain, which causes the dog to bite. That's pain aggression. Uh, I, you know, like I said, we could go through the different um, types of aggression and how to deal with them. There's uh, um, the uh, predatory aggression. I was just thinking that's why your 10-week-old puppy chases the blowing leaf. The movement of a leaf elicits the prey drive and those dogs that are very predatory aggressive are car chasers, bicycle chasers, you know, you know joggers, they chase. Um, that's a predatory aggression. The movement elicits that prey drive. And very often, you know, sometimes I had to explain when they had a herding dog and the dog was, you know, nipping at the ankles that it really wasn't predatory. This was a uh, herding instinct that, uh, you know, the Australian Shepherd or whatever it was, um, this is not really predatory, just a strong uh, herding instinct and we would deal with that. So, uh, you know, that's why I'm a Depends trainer, depending on what I see, depending on the ability of the owners to, um, affect the change that I like them to affect. I, I need to really adapt the training methodology to what will work. Um, you know, I mean, that was the whole point. I never advertised. Uh, it was all word of mouth, so success was, was very important. Now, you've already mentioned the gentle leader, but do you have any other recommendations for products for pet parents who are trying to train different types of dogs from puppies to seniors, dogs that pull, et cetera? It's terrific now. I would also say if you're going to recommend a gentle leader, do not recommend the head halty. Um, the, the head halty slips off the head, so they put on an extra device so it wouldn't. The gentle leader doesn't. So I would, I would highly suggest it's a, it's a gentle leader, not the head halty. They look similar, but they are not. So don't go into um, the, the head halty. I would suggest you recommend the gentle leader. Um, and I would not recommend the prong collar. Uh, I would recommend for the uh, praxisophallic dogs, you, you know, an easy walk harness. Or even, you know, the mismatches, which I see all the time. You have a, you know, 90-pound uh, elderly lady who gets a 70-pound labradoodle. Um, that's a potential accident waiting to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, so that would require immediately training for a gentle leader. And we could also, if you want, discuss as a tool uh, the e-collars, and e-collars can administer a tone, a vibration, and the, the stim, electric stim. And I, for off-leash dogs, that can be um, a really important tool. And for my standard poodle, I live across the street from a lake, and we have tons of geese and duck, uh, and ducks, and um, coprophagia, as you probably know, is when dogs eat poop. And I could say leave it, but my dog is, uh, as I said, a standard poodle, very fast. And this is a huge field around the lake. And she will gobble up little pieces of fecal matter, um, you know, goose poop. So I put an electric collar, uh, a, uh, a knee collar on her. And I've never used the electric stem, I use the vibration. And when I see her bend down, I can be, you know, 100 yards away, I just push the button and she, she'll she jump a foot in the air, being startled by the vibration. I say nothing. I need her to relate it to the uh, eating of the poop. If I'm yelling, leave it for that, then when I'm not around or I, she's 200 yards away and I can't see if she's eating poop or not, it becomes fair game. And I refer to this um, 
as the dog god concept. Um, and I'll give you another example, which I think your listeners will appreciate. Let's say your dog will not, you're eating, uh, you're having a hamburger dinner, and your dog will just ignore you uh, and ignore the table um, while you're eating hamburgers. And then you have dessert on the co- low coffee table while you're watching TV. And the dog is very civil. But now you walk out of the room for whatever reason, and you have this low coffee table, and there's the donut on it. You're not in the room, and now the dog immediately grabs the donut. The solution to that is the dog god concept, which I kind of created that expression a whole lot of years ago. You, I tell people what you need to do is take a Tupperware container and perforate it a whole lot and put the food in there, put the, the hot dog in there. And if you're gonna put a hot dog, I tell them put it in the microwave so it's really odiferous, gives off a lot of scent. And put it in the Tupperware container and put it on your coffee table and walk out of the room. Now, however, you set up a mirror so that being out of the room, you could see the dog and the dog does not know that you can see the dog. And now again, depending on the sensitivity of the dog, um, you walk out of the room and the moment the dog's nose touches that Tupperware container, bang two pots together. The dog is likely to screw itself through the ceiling and startlement, but it's gonna relate to that negative startlement to taking the food off the co- coffee table. You have nothing to do with it. The dog guy sees all, all the time and doesn't like it when you take my stuff. The reason I put it in the Tupperware container is I don't want the dog to self-reward. If you just put a hot dog on the coffee table on a plate and the dog just swallows it quickly, even if you you know startle it, it's still self-rewarded. It must not get that hot dog. So that's the dog god concept, and I've used that, um, you know, for destructive chewing, where a dog, let's say, um, and you have dogs that, it depends on the dogs that are into wood, they chew the chair legs, um, or moldings, you have dogs into cloth that tear up the, the, uh, the couch cushions, you have dogs that are into plastic, that destroy, you know, your eye, your reading glasses and the TV clicker. I mean, if dogs are into it all, um, I will set the dogs up. I confront problems. I will set them up with a mirror and use the dog god concept, whatever startles the dog. It could be two pots. Um, I've had a person who used to be a referee for his kid's soccer games, and he had the uh, that air horn. <laughs> that was hilarious, the man said. When the dog went for the food, he just blasted the air horn. I think he had to do it twice, and the dog, you know, would look askance at the food when he looked in the mirror and said, I'm not going near that food. Again, what's critical here is the timing. The timing is critical. And when I tell somebody for, um, let's say, for stopping a dog from stealing food off the table, and the dog ignores uh, two pots banging together, I may suggest an e-collar and we'll use uh, the vibration. And again, I, and I have never said to somebody, get an e-collar and put it on the dog. I said, get an e-collar, read the instructions, and don't otherwise touch it. Wait till I get there. And then depending on what we're dealing with, if I have a 140-pound Rottweiler that wants to kill every dog it sees, I'm going to use a different type of stimulation that I'm going to use for the dog that eats goose poop. So again, I am a depends trainer. What I'm dealing with really depends on the issue I need to um, affect change with. So very important concept. Um, and the most important is, again, what I what I initially talked about was socializing and uh, avoiding the inadvertent rewarding of unwanted behavior. And that's predicated on timing, body language, and voice intonation. Um, I mean, that's really, 
um, summarize his dog training if you really want to um, get a cooperative dog. It's about his being properly socialized and you're communicating to him with excellent timing through body language, be it petting or a smile or kneeling down and um, uh, voice intonation, um, which again is uh, based on timing is it's extremely important that makes all the difference um, all the difference in the world um, we've talked a lot about like different kinds of aggression and um, what to do if you can train your dog yourself but what if you can't uh, what are some reasons why people may seek out the help of a professional trainer and how do you know when you need the help of a professional and this is not something that you're going to be able to handle on your own um you know, one of the biggest issues that, and it's a difficult issue to deal with, you're walking on a is leash aggression, where the dog sees another dog on a leash and gets aggressive. Um, most of the clients will, will tell their dog that's leash aggressive to sit and stay and wait till the other dog passes. And the analogy I use is, what if I told you to sit on the train tracks and stay as the train is approaching? That's what you're basically asking of the dog. The dog's gonna be completely nuts as the other dog is getting closer and closer. So again, here is a very important concept. When you see another dog and your dog's on a leash, before it gets aggressive, start making love to your dog with your voice. Your attitude is, um, and, and, and let me explain, take a step back. What most people do when they see another dog, they anticipate their own dog getting aggressive. So what they do is they tighten the leash and they use the dog's name with anxiety in their voice, you know, Bowser, and they tighten the leash. Now the dog may not have even seen the other dog, but all of a sudden, its neck feels very tight. It feels the tension you've just um, transferred to the dog through the leash, and it hears the anxiety in your voice, and what's it gonna relate this anxiety to? The dog it's looking at. So you're actually exacerbating the problem, and so many people do that. So what I tell them is, start making love to the dog and offering it treats with a loose leash. Yes, that could be your best friend. Look at that little golden retriever approaching. Isn't that great? And you're actually conning your dog. And the dog is now getting a positive association with the other dog it sees approaching it. And for goodness sakes, don't stop and stay. Keep walking, keep the dog active. And then if the dog gets aggressive, I step in front of the dog and will correct it. And again, how I correct it, it could just be an uh-uh. I don't use the word no, as I said, I say uh-uh. And the split second the dog stops aggressing because I broke an eye contact, I immediately keep walking and start praising the dog. Again, the timing is critical. And with most leash aggressive, aggressive dogs, I really need to be there. I can explain how to do this to the client, but rarely is it is done with, um, with success because it's, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, it really is a difficult one to, to deal with because very often the dog's been doing it uh, for a very long time and it just expects, express, expects this kind of aggression on a leash. You'll also find, Samantha, dogs are much less aggressive on leash than off leash. And where most people think the dog is really protecting them, I tell them, the reality is, it's almost like the kid is pretty tough because his big brother is standing behind him. So when you're attached by leash, the dog is much bolder uh, because it thinks you have its back. Um, and when I go to a 
large area called Trade Winds where I live where people walk their dogs, very large fields, and we go with a leash aggressive dog. I have him drop the leash the moment we see another dog and walk at a 90 degree angle away from their dog. And 90% of the time the dog realizes he's on his own. He becomes a lot more civil. He's a much less aggressive. Um, again, and I make that decision based on my having met the dog and worked with the dog. And in the majority of cases, dogs are, are really much more mellow off leash than on leash. That leash attachment is much more likely to elicit an aggressive response if the dog has had um, experience with this. And I just basically finished working with a Maltese, which uh, and I think he's Monty is uh, seven or eight years old, and the woman would pick the dog up and basically hold it and put it on it or her halfway up to her shoulder as the dog was going to desert because another dog had the audacity to be walking by. And this took three or four lessons. Uh, and I was able to affect the change with an e-collar using vibration. And it would startle the dog and, it may, you know, really praising the dog and giving it treats. Um, it took three lessons to be precise. We can approach another dog, start praising Monty, this little Maltese, and we're good. It needs another dog, it'll have some tentative sniffs, and then you keep going. And I also tell people when you have this successful meeting, don't keep lingering, just go and have success build on success. Really quickly before we go, uh, would you tell us a little bit about your book? I did link to it, uh, the Amazon link for anybody that's interested in buying it. It's Dog Training Diaries, Proven Expert Tips and Tricks to Live in Harmony with Your Dog. The book I originally wrote was 22 stories. I've got amazing stories. I, you know, I've trained 100 celebrities' dogs, um, and I got a lot of really crazy stories. I, you know, just a brief example uh, of one, which is not in the book, um, where a lady left with her elderly mother, went to Manhattan, and she had two dogs, a, a 70 pound mixed breed, chow mixed breed, and a small terrier. And a thief broke into the house and killed the terrier with a blunt instrument with a, um, a you know, a figurine that the lady had, a, sta a little statue. And the big dog had a barking collar on because it lived in a condominium, condominium and the dog um, got, every time it barked at this thief, it got a shock. And when the lady came home to the dead uh, small dog, um, she immediately took the leash and, and uh, took the collar off the large dog. And from that point on, that dog would not allow any collar or leash to be put on. And she had a little garden outside her condo for 11 months. She could not take this dog out for a walk, and she called the vet who gave it some drugs, um, who got his pants ripped as the dog, uh, dog tried to bite it. Um, she, nobody could put a collar on this dog, and that was a, a very interesting lesson for me to get. Plus, what happens when you don't do a dog's nails, as you probably know, the nails get longer and longer, which destroy the foot and it goes right up the leg. The, you know, the, the, uh, the nails start splaying outwards. So this dog's nails in 11 months were ridiculous. So she asked me if I could get a collar on the dog and cut the dog's nails. So I've had crazy stories like that, and I wrote 22 of them. And when Skyhorse Publishing said they'd publish it, but they won't publish the 22 stories, they want a training manual, and they'll include some of the stories. So I agreed to that and I wrote a training manual, which I think it's not the usual type of training manual. It's not dry. I get lots of experiences uh, of things that happened to me and they included um, some hilarious stories, some really tragic stories. It's not the run of the mill training manual that's boring. You know, and for example, they included a story that had to do with what I was teaching. So one of my lines in the book is, 
It's amazing how much of my life revolves around feces and urine. And it's funny <laughs> that that may sound, Samantha, you're laughing, but I don't care if a dog does your kid's homework and takes out the garbage and loads the dishwasher. If it's pooping or peeing in the house, it gets real old real fast. Absolutely. So be, it, be it the puppy that you adopt, that you get, or the five-year-old dog that you adopt and is, is urinating and defecating in the house, housebreaking is is major and I, I work with Joan Rivers dogs and her issue was pooping and peeing the dogs were totally unhoused broken so when they included the story of when I dealt with Joan Rivers because that had to do with housebreaking so four or five of my 22 stories are in there and some are pretty dramatic stories um, and I had to write a training manual, and my hope is if it gets a reasonable reception, then I can, they'll publish the other 18 stories, which I think people are really going to enjoy. They're all true. They're not embellished. Um, you know, I, I really tell it like it is, and I'll tell you something else that is going to bring me, um, I was going to say grief. It's going to bring me some adversity. Every single uh, manual that comes with the electro the e collars, the instruction booklet, I disagree with dramatically. If you're going to actually use an electronic skim to um, for training one way or another, they say start with a light stimulation, and if that doesn't work, increase the stimulation. That to me is nuts. And I have worked, I've been, I, I haven't embellished, I had eight to nine hundred appointments a year, half the behavior problems. I would look at the issue one that we want to deal with. I would set the collar and skim myself on my arm to feel exactly what the dog is feeling. And based on my experience, I would pick a stimulation level that's not going to, you know, freak the dog out, but make them cognizant that it's unpleasant in conjunction with the behavior I want to stop, if I want to stop the behavior. And I would probably use a tone, I'd hit tone stem, or actually I'd use a verbal command, perhaps leave a tone stem. And within a couple of stems, I can now bring the level of stem down. They develop a sensitivity to it. And in a couple of lessons, I just say, leave it tone. And then after that, all I do have to do is say, leave it. To me, to follow the instruction manuals and start raising it, you're actually teaching the dogs to adapt to being you know, shocked. And that to me made no sense. So I had never allowed a person to put the collar on without my being there. And again, depending, I'm the depends trainer on what issue I need to deal with is, is what I use in the collar and how I set it. So that's what the book is about. It's really not your one of the mill training manual uh, you can refer to when something may need to refer to something else it says C page whatever and you can go back to that if you need to really deal with a particular issue I also have some pictures in there of my search dog again we we're talking about predatory aggression my search dog Michelle about whom I wrote the book would go under my parakeet cage and whine and I would open the cage she would without a command lay down and the parakeets would walk all over her and love her loved her and I have one of the pictures in the book is she is uh, in a down position with a two parakeets on her, on her leg. My other search dog, Mikey, named in her honor, <laughs> he would have eaten those parakeets in a heartbeat. He was very predatory aggressive and more difficult to train on a leave-in when a squirrel or a skunk went by when we were on a search. But he tracked a woman 11 miles to make the find, and that was tracking, which meant I had to be behind him on a 40 foot leash for, the, leash for the 11 miles. Michelle as a search dog found two people alive, some not, and almost all of that was air scenting, um, depending on where we were. So, like I said, lots of experience. I think people are gonna read this book and enjoy it, as opposed to, I gotta do my homework and learn how to do this. The 
really, uh, with some of the stories, they'll get a kick out of it, and I think they'll learn a heck of a lot. So I really feel like that. The book is really fantastic. Uh, as Tom said, you know, for anybody that's thinking about it, you do get the dog training tips along with uh, a lot of his uh, own firsthand experience and some of the stories that he has from his many years of dog training. So I hope you guys enjoyed this interview. If you did uh, and you could take a few minutes to jump on iTunes and leave me a review, that would be really great. When I reach out to experts in the industry like Tom, it makes it a lot easier when I can show them your reviews that you are out there listening and you really enjoy it so uh, again if you could leave a quick review that would be great a big thanks again to Tom Shelby for uh, coming on the podcast today his uh, book is available now the link is below this podcast if you're interested in purchasing it on Amazon it's about $12 so very inexpensive Um, if you guys have any questions that I might be able to answer or that I can pass along to Tom feel free to do so there is a link on our website theoryofpets.com right on the side for comments and questions Thanks a lot for listening, and I will be back with another hot topic next week.